Good morning. Welcome to our online version of this morning service here at Blackpool Tabernacle Church. The, the service will include some worship songs, a children's story and a song and, and preaching this morning is our pastor Jonathan Wilson. We do hope this service will be a blessing to you and pray that God himself would speak to you through his word. We do encourage you to look at our YouTube channel and, and our other uh, services shared via that and also for the latest updates from the church uh, please do see our Facebook page you'll find at the end of this service uh, a slide which will contain information uh, as well on on those services on that Facebook page and also means that you can contact us so please do reach out if you've got questions or if we can help or support you in any way well let's start our service now and we'll begin it by singing our first song
we've been looking at what love is over the last few weeks and we've seen that love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy and this week we want to look at love does not boast and is not puffed up. And I want to tell you a story this week about someone who was very uh, boastful and proud and puffed up and someone else who um, trusted in God and showed love by uh, not being proud and not being boastful, but trusting in God and his strength. This is a story I'm sure many of you will have heard. Uh, it's the story of David and Goliath, but perhaps you've never thought about this uh, this way before, about uh, pride, pride and being boastful. Now, when the armies of the Israelites, the children of God, and the Philistines came together, the champion Goliath, the giant, came out from the Philistine's side, and this is what he said. I'm the giant Goliath. No one can defeat me. I am bigger and stronger than all of Israel's armies put together. Send out your best soldier, and if I beat him, you will become our slaves. And if he beats me, then us Philistines will be your slaves. All the Israelite soldiers were terrified and too scared to fight Goliath. All except one young boy called David. Now he wasn't proud and boastful that he had killed lions and wild bears when he was protecting his sheep. But he trusted in God and in God's strength. Now, when David came out to fight Goliath, he laughed and said this. Ha 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 ha! You send out this shepherd boy to me? I've killed warriors and champions. This boy doesn't stand a chance against me. When David got close to Goliath, he swung his sling round and round his head with a sharp stone in it. And he released it and it flew into Goliath's head and killed him. You might wonder, how are we going to learn about love and about how love does not boast through this story? Well, is there ever times where you maybe think or act like Goliath? Now, perhaps in front of your friends, you might boast that you have all the best things or that you're the smartest. Maybe to your brothers and sisters, you might uh, always talk about the awards you've won at school or the medals you've won at sport. It might even not be something that uh, you even say out loud. It might be just something you think. You might think, mm, I'm better than those people. Well, I go to church and they don't. Now, God doesn't want us to think like that at all. God doesn't want us to be proud or boastful or puffed up. If you want to show love, you need to act like David did and uh, be thankful to God for the gifts that you have, but um, not be proud in yourself. So maybe you are uh, really smart, but that to show love, you wouldn't uh, go out of your way to show that to people or to make anyone else feel little or stupid. Um, you might be really good at sports. You might win lots of medals and awards and be really great well you should give thanks and glory to God for giving you those gifts so remember love does not boast so let's remind ourselves what we've learned so far about love love is patient love is kind love does not envy love does not boast and if you want to learn lots more about love Come back next week to find out what else God says love is.
Love is patient, love is kind, everywhere and every time. It gives its place in line to serve another. But my heart, it struggles so. I need your grace to grow. Lord, help me give and show this love to others. Jesus set me free to love unselfishly.
Thank you, Conrad. Do you want to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 36? Psalm 36. An oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for he flatters himself in his own eyes when he finds out his iniquity and when he hates the words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. He devises wickedness on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not abhor evil. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O continue your loving kindness to those who know you, and your righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me, and let not the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the workers of iniquity have fallen, they have been cast down, and are not able to rise. Amen. Okay, let's, uh, let's just pray. Let's turn to the Lord and pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you, we do praise you that we're able to come uh, here together into your presence. Uh, we do thank you for this day, O oh Lord. It is the first day of the week. It is a day, O oh Lord, ordained by you that is set aside in order that we can rest and that we can rest in you. And we do thank you, O oh Lord, even this morning for the privilege of being able to meet together. We thank you, O oh Lord, that uh, where we meet, you meet with us. Where two or three are gathered together in your name, there are you amongst us in the midst. And we do thank you and we do praise you that we believe, Lord, by faith, that you speak to us, you speak to us through your word. Lord, this is a living word. Uh, it's, it's a powerful word. It, it can penetrate the hardest of hearts, the truth of it. And we do pray, even today, O oh Lord, that the truth of this word, by the aid of your Holy Spirit, would indeed penetrate our hearts, that we might hear you, that we might have ears to hear. Lord, we pray that you would uh, block out any distractions, any distracting thoughts, any uh, unhelpful thoughts. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would uh, really help us to be attentive to your word, that, Father, we believe that you, mighty God, speak to us. And what an awesome thought that is. We are mindful, O oh Lord, of the world in which we live. We think, O oh Lord, of the times in which we live. We, again, O oh Lord, pray that you would be merciful to us. We think of this COVID pandemic, and uh, Lord, we thank you that there seems to be some measure of, of success with the vaccines. But we pray, O oh Lord, that that would continue if it be according to your will. And not only our nation, Lord, we remember the various nations across this globe. We think especially of India and the suffering that is going there at this moment. We thank you for the efforts of outside agencies and countries seeking to help those people. And we thank you, O oh Lord, that there seems to be some measure of progress. But nevertheless, O oh God, we pray for those many thousands, hundreds, tens of thousands of people who are uh, um, suffering so much. We are mindful, O oh Lord, it makes us aware again, O oh Lord, that we are one breath away from eternity. And so, O oh God, we pray that whilst there is bodily suffering, it would cause people to consider their eternal state, that they would consider their creator, uh, Lord. And uh, Father, we thank you uh, that we can make plans. We thank you that we can um, do things, Lord. And even this week, we think of the week ahead and we commit this week into your hands and we do pray oh god that we would uh, know that it is you who gives us the days uh, and lord that our days are numbered and that we would lord have wisdom in how we would use our time we pray for those amongst us who are christians that we would lord use our time to your glory and to your good 
And we pray, O oh God, for those amongst us even now who as yet do not know you. We pray, O oh God, that you would be merciful to them and that they would, Lord, come to you quickly. Now is the day of salvation, that they would see that and that they would come and trust in the one who is lovely, the loveliest of 10,000, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who laid down his life. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you that we have this great, glorious good news to proclaim. And we do pray, Lord, after we have worshipped in this song, we do pray that we would, uh, you would enable the preacher to proclaim that good news in the power of the Holy Spirit and that your Son would be lifted up and magnified and glorified amongst us. We thank you, oh God, that we can ask these things. We pray that you would forgive us for our sin, but we thank you that there is one to whom we can go to. There is one to whom we can turn, because there is one to whom has, he has paid that price that is due to us. Blessed be his name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, if you have a, a Bible in front of you, please turn with me to Psalm uh, 36. So I was uh, sat um, outside on a patio, uh, reading my Bible uh, last week, uh, or the week before, and uh, a verse from here just hit me between the eyes, so much so that I uh, said to my wife, here, listen to this. And uh, the verse that hit me, I'm going to read it from uh, the NIV, which is, is what I use. Uh, verse 2, for in his own eyes, he flatters himself too much to detect or hate his sin. Now, that grabbed my attention. Uh, um, we believe, don't we, that the word is a, is a living word. We believe that God speaks. And every time we pr uh, read the Bible, before it, oftentimes, we will pray, please speak to me now through your word. This isn't just a normal book. It's a wonderful book. It's, the literature is phenomenal, the ver variations of it, the different styles of it. People will study it as a linguistic masterpiece. But for us, this is more. This is dynamite. This is a living word. And uh, truthfully, then, I can, uh, I can give thanks to God because he spoke to me through this verse. And I want to share, really, that this morning. And uh, we're going to look, God willing, then, at the whole of the psalm as an overview. But uh, our anchor, if you will, is in this verse. This thought that someone is flattering themselves. Someone has a false view of themselves, so much so that they don't even spot and they don't even despise the thing that is causing them eternal death. I think that's a, a powerful uh, picture. The psalmist, he starts off and he says, I've got a message, I've got an oracle in my heart concerning this body of people. He calls them the wicked. So we have straight away, we have this uh, group of people that is being described by the psalmist. And the first thing he says is this, there is no fear of God before their eyes. They don't fear God. Now that might come as a shock to you. You might say, well, why should we fear God? Isn't God this, um, or this, this um, benevolent being? And of course, God is love. And we're learning about that uh, with the children's messages each week. But nevertheless, they don't have a fear of God. Why? Because as we go on to see it, really, ultimately, they don't see God. Their view of God is clouded. They have a false view. And in a, later on, God willing, we'll begin to look at a clear view of God and we'll begin to see why we should fear God. Not with this craven fear, not with this terror that would ask that the rocks would fall on us. But if uh, we, we get a, gr a, a right picture, we'll begin to see that actually, though he is a God to be feared, he is also a God to be worshipped and adored. But nevertheless, back, back to it. The first thing is this person, uh, this group of people, the wicked, as described by the psalmist, they don't have a fear of God. And that manifests itself in a number of ways. They don't listen to God's word. They don't truly come under God's instruction. Uh, you know, it's very easy to read this Bible and it's very easy to pick, pick bits that we like and go to those passages we might be people who consider ourselves to be religious. We might even read the Bible during the week. That's going some, isn't it? We would be in a very small minority of uh, people in this country if we were doing that. But nevertheless, we can still do that and yet not fear God. How so? Well, we can, we can read something and if we don't like it, what do we do? We turn over the page 
And we can read something and we can just ignore it. Or we can make it into something that the Bible isn't really saying what it's saying. Well, that's one way. But there's many, many areas in which this lack of a fear of God, this absence of a fear of God, manifests itself. And then we have this second symptom of this person, this group of people that the psalmist is describing. And we come on to it in verse 2. They flatter themselves. Now, we had a discussion, a group discussion a few weeks back about the difference between flattery and encouragement. The Bible says we are to encourage each other. And we saw that the word encourage means to give courage to someone. And that's a whole world away from flattery, isn't it? And the, the, somebody picked up on the kernel of the difference. Well, the difference with flattery is it's the motive. So there, somebody is flattering themselves. Their motive is to uh, big themselves up, as it were. We, we heard about boasting. And, uh, and in the song we just sung, we said, we won't boast in any gift or things like that. We'll boast in Jesus Christ. But here, the person themselves, they boast about themselves. They flatter themselves. They big themselves up. And that's, again, another symptom of someone who in the psalmist's eyes is wicked. They flatter themselves. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that, then you don't get a correct picture of yourself. So not only is your view of God cloudy and clouded, and it's a wrong view then, but so too the person, uh, the group that is described here, their view of themselves is cloudy. And again, we see that demonstrated, don't we? The, times of com the numbers of times of conversations I've had with people and uh, you, you, you ask them about what about the law of God? What about God's perfect law? What about God's the Ten Commandments? What about where God shows that we're breaking his commandments and he's doing it to show us the truth about ourselves and the truth about him that he is perfect and we are not? And the answer comes back, oh yes, but I'm not as bad as that person over there. Oh yes, but it's only a little lie. And what does that show? It shows that they haven't got a clear view of themselves, nor a clear view of sin. You see, we see in, this, in the second part of the verse, they, he flatters himself, or they flatter themselves, too much to detect or hate sin. You know, the person then, this, this group that is being described, the group called the wicked, they have not a clear view of God, they don't have a clear view of self, and then they don't have a clear view of sin. You see, nowadays, it's, it's described in the Bible, the, the things that are wrong are, are decided to be right. The things that are right are decided to be wrong. There's this topsy-turvy view of what sin is. But sin, ultimately, is anything that robs God of his glory. And when we go our own way, when we do our own thing, when we are, uh, do, have our own will and uh, choose to go our own, our own way rather than God's way, what is that? That's sin. Because it's robbing God of his glory. And sin is impure. Sin never adds to anything. It, it takes away. The only thing that sin came, brought with it, is death. And the person who has no uh, a clear view, doesn't have a clear view of themselves, well, they don't spot the sin in themselves. They don't see the faults in themselves. They don't see the truth about themselves. They're not able to look in the mirror and see the reality of what their heart is and see that actually their heart is, is, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, as the Bible tells us. They fudge things. They justify things. They put it down to certain situations and they don't confront it, much less hate it. Why does the person that this, uh, or, the, or the group that this, this psalmist describes, why do they not hate sin? Well, because we, we don't hate sin, do we? We hate the consequences of sin. Nobody's happy about the consequences of, of sin, but we quite like it when we feel offended and we, and we stand our ground and we get angry and we sin as a result of it. Or we quite like it if we allow ourselves to look at something for longer than we ought to. Or if we, if we uh, go down a certain route. And we, why? Because we're fulfilling the pleasures of self. We're feeding ourselves rather than following God. And then the psalmist goes on. Uh, not only the heart, but now the heart it emanates from. The heart into the words. Verse 3. The words of his mouth are wicked and deceitful. Well, he's painting a, a dark picture, isn't it? He has ceased to be wise and to do good. Even on his bed, he plots evil. 
So the thoughts, the thoughts of this person, the thoughts of this people group who are described as wicked by the psalmist, even their thoughts now are affected. It's not just what they do, it's what they think. And what's in the heart manifests itself into what they think and what they do. And even their will, the will is, is, is corrupted, is twisted, is warped. Look at this verse 4. Even on his bed he plots evil. There's this picture, isn't there, of this person who is just, uh, there's, there's, there's nothing redeemable in that sense about this person. This person is given over to, to uh, uh, fulfilling, as it were, uh, self, and it's antagonistic towards anything else. He commits himself to a sinful cause and does not reject what is wrong. It suggests here that the person knows that he's doing wrong. It suggests here that the person knows deep down, perhaps in the conscience, that there's something not right, but it's rejected. That, that voice that says, this is not right, that's rejected. And they continue on their course. Well, who is the psalmist talking about? Is it just a minority? Is it just this wicked group that we can all sit back and go, I'm glad I'm not one of those? Well, Paul quotes this verse from this psalm. In uh, Romans 3, he has this long list of, it's like, uh, you know how you have the greatest hits? It's like an anthology, a compilation of verses, random verses from the psalms, which he puts together to create this greatest hit on a person. Because what is the psalmist, who is the psalmist talking about? The psalmist is talking about you and me. The Bible describes it as the natural man. The person naturally. The natural man is at enmity or has hostility towards God. The natural man is dark and, uh, and blinded. They're dead in trespasses and sins. The natural man, his desires are only ever evil. And we say, whoa, hold on a minute, that's not me. I'm not that bad. I can compare myself favorably with the person next door. That's the point. We haven't seen the light. We haven't seen the truth. No, in, uh, in Romans 3 verse 18, Paul says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. He's quoting this psalm. And what is he saying? This is about all of us, all of us naturally. So way back when in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they were without fault. They could have continued it without sinning, but they also could have chosen to fall, uh, chosen to disobey. And guess what? The, the tragedy of it is they chose to disobey. So they went against God. They disobeyed God. They listened to the lie of the devil and they chose to disobey. And as a result of that, sin came in. As a result of that, humanity fell with a great crash. And ever since then, we have this hereditary disease. We have this inherited nature, which is a fallen nature. And it manifests itself in a variety of ways. So you don't have to teach your child to do wrong. It's instinctive. And yes, you have varying degrees of depravity in the world, of course. You have the person who's a very great, upstanding citizen. You have the person who's an absolute shocker. But nevertheless, they have the same heart. We're in the same boat. Naturally, we are against God. And naturally, we don't see a clear view of God, a clear view of ourselves, or a clear view of sin. It's cloudy. But the psalmist doesn't stop there. He paints this picture of the natural man. But then he begins to clear the fog. He begins to give a clear view of God. And what of you, friends? What of you? Praise God that we have the scriptures to tell us who God is. You know, we have creation. The Bible says that creation is like God's signature saying, I'm here. Look at my majesty, look at my genius, look at my creative power. You know, it tells us elsewhere in the Psalms, it tells us that the animals know that they have a, a, a creator, a sustainer. It's instinctive, they look up and they, they, they look up to their creator. But here we're told something of the character of God. And you can divide it into two parts. First of all, the immensity of God. Have you noticed with the, if you read it in your own time, the first four verses, it gets very kind of insular, very inwards, very restrictive. On his bed, it's almost like this darkened room and on his bed there's this person plotting. Well here the curtains are thrown open and there's this immensity. Look at the language. Your love or your loving kindness, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens, reaches 
high. It's this immensity. It's this infinitude. In other words, this God. Who is this God? Let's have a clear view of God. You've said that we have, a, uh, we have naturally, we have this foggy view. Okay, now present this clear view. Okay, get ready. Fasten your seatbelts. Because here is a clear view of God. He is immense. He is infinite. His love. There's no limit. His love has no limit. It's this ocean of love that just keeps going and going and going. And then his faithfulness. Oh, you see, don't you want a God who is loving and is trustworthy? Oh, his faithfulness. Even when we fail him, he cannot fail himself. He cannot deny himself. He is faithful to his word. And so that's why we can trust upon his word. That's why we can put our whole weight upon his word. Because it won't buckle. It won't fail. It won't, it, it won't rust away. His faithfulness is to the skies. Look at this language. It, this language contrasts the, the, the minuscule uh, uh, stodgy. That's the wrong word, but I want to use it anyway. That kind of person who uh, in themselves and cloudy and foggy and limited and, and cramped. Now the expanse of God, the vastness of God the immensity of God, the infinitude of God and then this in verse 6 your righteousness is like mighty mountains, there's that immovable object, God's righteousness, God is pure, God is righteous, God is holy and it's like great mountains immovable, absolutely immovable, the massive kind of righteousness of God and then let's move on. He says, your justice is like the great deep, or your judgments are like the deep ocean. In other words, God's assessments are absolutely right. God's assessments of you and me are absolutely right. So when one day we're standing before Almighty God and he assesses our lives, he will be absolutely spot on. There will be no court of appeal. There will be no recourse to, to uh, saying we want another judgment on this. His assessments are absolutely correct. And his justice then is absolutely perfect. This is a God who will, to whom we will always see the great justice being meted out. There will never be miscarriages of justice. Oh, and if you're on the right side of God, that's wonderful, isn't it? Because it's a God whom you can trust. But, but if you're on the wrong side of God, what does that create? This fear. This is a God who cannot be toyed with. This is a God who cannot be messed with. This is a God who cannot be ignored and the page just turned. No, this is a God who must be listened to. This is a God who must be heeded. This is a, a God who must be submitted to. And then he goes on to say, oh Lord, you preserve or you save both man and beast. Friends, why are we still here? Why is it that the earth spins on its axis? You know those, those plates, those spinning tops? And eventually you spin and then it flies off. Why has that not happened to earth? <laughs> Anybody thought that? He's still spinning at 20 something degrees and he's still going. Why? Because God is in control. Because God is keeping us. Why is it that I can breathe? Oh, well, it's because of the... Uh, or, you know, you the biological answer, which I can't give, I don't know. But it doesn't matter, above and beyond that, because God gives you the breath to breathe. Why is it that we're not all worse than we are? Because God restrains. God keeps us. Why is it things tick as they do? You know, when man tries to get involved and takes a, uh, takes a layer out of the ecosystem and perhaps, uh, I don't know, takes, uh, shoots all the rabbits or something like that with myxomatosis, not because of the evil trying to help, but all of a sudden there's unintended consequences. And you realise just how finely balanced this ecosystem is. Why is it so finely balanced? Because God preserves. God keeps. God saves. Are we getting the picture? Us. God. That's a clear view of God. And a clear view of man then is that they, we're to, we are the creature, not the creator. He is to be worshipped. He is to be adored. He is to be obeyed. He is to be followed. And then, having seen the immensity of God, we come towards the intimacy of God. We say it reverently, but what use is a God to whom we can just observe? No, this is a God who is to be known. This is a God who is to be communed with. Think of it. The awesome thought that this God who is so vast and so great and so mighty is a God who wants to come and dwell with us by his Holy Spirit. And so the psalmist says in verse 7. How priceless or how precious is your loving kindness. Or your unfailing love. 
Now this is experience speaking. This is the psalmist who's described the wicked. He's described the natural man. He's described himself before he met with God. But now he describes what it is to know this God. Yes, to fear him because he is almighty God. And he, is, he knows everything. And he is all powerful. But now it, to experience him. What is it to experience God, friends? What is it to truly come and experience him? What is it compared with this sniveling person who's plotting evil in his bed? Oh, to experience God is precious. It's precious. It's priceless. In other words, there's nothing that can compare with it. There is nothing that can compare with knowing God and experiencing, tasting, taste and see that the Lord is good. Experience that unfailing love in our lives. To know that though we are at enmity with him, though we are at hostility against him, though we have the audacity for the creature to rear its head at the creator, yet God somehow, some way, finds a way of showing his love so that we can know him and love him. And be with him. How is that the way? Well he goes on into verse 7. Both high and low among men. Find refuge in the shadow of your wings. Or even better. In the, in the version that was read. In the translation that was read. Um, uh, Therefore children of men put their trust. Under the shadow of your wings. This view. And we'll see it tonight with Ruth. This view of refuge. This view of rest. What is the person, the natural man, what is the, in, what is the reaction when they see Almighty God for the first time, when they understand something of Almighty God? There's this reality of who am I? But now more than that, well, how can I know this God? How can I, who is so uh, wicked, I begin to see the truth of myself. The fog begins to clear. I begin to see self as it really is. I begin to see sin as it really is. I begin to see God for who he really is. How can I possibly know him? How can I possibly love him? Because he has first loved us. That's how. Because he sent his son to die in our place. That's how. Because on the cross Christ bore the wrath. That was due to you and me. That's why. Because before even the foundations of the earth. He had this plan. This wonderful plan. This covenant between the father and the son. That the son would come down. And he would live perfectly. He would keep the, the law perfectly. And then he would die perfectly upon that cross. And in our place he would bear the punishment. That is due to you and to me. And having done so. He would then make this path of salvation clear. Make this road open. So that he is the way, the truth and life. To the father. And anyone who knows and loves and responds to this call. What do they do? They run to the Lord Jesus Christ. They find refuge under the shadow of his wings. They trust in him. They turn from themselves. They see that snivelling on their bed. Plotting evil is not the way forward. There's no future in it. No good will come of it. And they turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they see that there is a path of pardon that has been made. And what do they do? They cry out for rescue. They cry out in trust. How do they do it? Because now the Holy Spirit has come and has wakened them up and has breathed life into them so they can see the truth as it is in Jesus. And what's the, what's the future then of the person who is now the spiritual person, the person who has been born again, the person who has seen the truth and the person who has trusted in this great offer of salvation, the person who has run to Jesus, what's the truth about them? Verse 8, they feast. In the, in the abundance of your house. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house. Oh, this is the future. This is the, this is the experience of the person now who is a spiritual person. The person who is a Christian. A true believer in God. Someone who has truly been born again. What's the, what's the enjoyment of it? Don't worry about children crying. I like it. It reminds me of being at home and I'm homesick. <laughs> what is the truth about the person who's feasting? In the house of God. It means that they're satisfied. They eat and they are satisfied. It means that God's satisfied. What more than all of our self pleasures? Yes abundantly more. Because these things they don't last. These things are like a McDonald's. It tastes all right at the time. But ten minutes later you're still hungry. But God satisfies. And he goes on to talk about the, the, the water. The, 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 the drink. Verse 8. From, you give them drink from your river if you like. Ring any bells with the New Testament? You drink this water, you'll still be thirsty, but you, you drink of me and you won't be thirsty because I have the waters of life. There's no future, you see, for the natural man. But what it is to experience God now as a spiritual person, what it is to trust in him, you get to feast on his pure delights. You get to drink from the river of his pure delights. You are satisfied. Your thirst is quenched. And then he goes on to say, for with you is the fountain of life. Why is this? Because he is the giver, the source of life. 
All good things come from him and him alone. That means anything outside of him is not good. And even stronger than that is bad. But God is good. And then finally, in your light, we see light. What does that, what does that suggest? It suggests truth. When we see God, we get the truth. Don't you want the truth, friends? Don't you want the truth? <laughs> The truth will set you free. You want the truth. You need the truth. You want the fog to be cleared. You just give me the truth as it is. And he is the truth. And what, what else comes with light? You shine light on something, you get clarity. Oh, the clarity of it all. When we see God for who he is, his immensity, but also the intimacy that can be known through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. All things make sense. Testimony after testimony after testimony of Christians is that I once, I just things didn't make sense, but now they make sense. And then finally the psalmist goes on, he prays, verse 10, continue. What's the future of the natural man? The future of the natural man is found at the end. See how the evil do as lie fallen, thrown down, not able to rise. At the end of the first psalm, Psalm 1, uh, the way of the wicked will perish. That's the end, there's no hope, there's no future. For that people group, there's no future for the way of the wicked. There's no future for the natural man. Because they will be judged for their sin. And their judgment will be a true and just judgment. And the, ju and the sentence will be eternal death. The horror of it. But God is just. We know his justice are like the deep oceans. But what about the future of the person who has turned from that and run to the shadow. Run to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as we are without one plea, but that the blood of uh, the Lamb of God was, was shed for me. Oh, Lamb of God, I come. What of that person? Well, now they're feasting on him. They're drinking in his pure delights. They're enjoying him. They get to see the truth and clarity. But what about the future? What about when we leave this passing place? What about we die? when we die? Well, the Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. The best is yet to come. That's the truth. That's the truth. Continue your love to those who know you. For, what, for how long? Well, God is eternal. God is infinite. So his love continues eternally, infinitely. So the person who is now in Christ enjoys God for eternity, for all of eternity. Can you imagine that? And the glory of it is we'll never get bored. Why? Because God is infinite. Because as we go through one treasure trove of the truths of him and of, of reality of what the truth is in him, we realise that there's more and there's more and there's more. And our view of him just gets clearer and better. We go from standard definition to high definition to 4K to 8K to special K. We're amazed at the glory and wonder of who he is for all of eternity. I don't think there is a special K television. It's a series, isn't it? But you get the point. The point is, it just keeps getting better. In closing, what people group do you belong to? The natural man or the spiritual man? The ones who as yet to bow the knee to God. The ones who still, the self is still on the throne. The one who still makes your own rules and lives by them. Or are you the person who has come to the end of themselves and realised that he is God, not me, he. And we submit to him in all things, take me as I am. And we run to the Lord Jesus Christ who has made this way of salvation and we cast our cares upon him. If you're at that point, will he accept you? Just as you are, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He won't refuse anybody. Can you come now? Absolutely. He wants you to come now. Now, now, now is the day of salvation. Just as you are. Come. Just as you are. Warts and all. I know all about you already. So you can't frighten me. You can't shock me. Come just as you are. In utter dependence on me. Not independent of. In utter dependence upon me. Come. Just as you are. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Amen. Let's uh, finish by uh, worshipping together the testimony of someone who did just that. Amazing grace, my chains are gone.